Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Prem Paul. I have the honor of being Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development at UNL. And we are very appreciative that you joined us here for our fall Nebraska lecture, the second of the 2015 Chancellor's Distinguished Lecture Series. Today's lecture is being web streamed live, so I also want to welcome everyone who is joining us via the web. For those of you who use social media, the Twitter hashtag for today's lecture is Pound Neb Lecture. The Nebraska lectures are an interdisciplinary lecture series designed to foster communication among students and faculty in different academic areas and among our citizens and friends of Lincoln and Nebraska. These lectures are sponsored by the UNL Research Council in cooperation with the Office of the Chancellor, the Office of Research and Economic Development, and the Osher, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute known as OLLI. A warm welcome to any OLLI members who joined us today. So join me in welcoming all of you. So you probably are wondering, what the heck is Research Council? Well, I'd say Research Council is composed of faculty from across many disciplines at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Council solicits nominations of faculty for Nebraska lectures. The criteria is that they have major research, recent accomplishments, and the person's ability to explain their work. Selection as a Nebraska lecturer is the highest recognition the council can bestow on an individual faculty member. Research council also has some additional powers, like they have a money pot that they give seed grants to faculty. So faculty, like the research councils, uh, the seed funding. A few words about today's format following, following our lecture, Dr. Robert Powers who is chair of the Research Council and professor of chemistry, he will moderate a question and answer session. And there will be a couple of microphones uh, available, so we hope that you will use those. Then we'll have refreshments and tours of Nebraska Innovation Studio, also known as the Makerspace. And, uh, and that is located at the lower level. So at this time, it is my honor and a pleasure to introduce our wonderful Chancellor Harvey Perlman to introduce today's speakers. Please join me in welcoming Harvey. So thanks, Prem. Um, I've got these notes and I feel like I could introduce Shane uh, from just spontaneously, but then I would say things he wouldn't want me to say, so I'm gonna <laughs> stick mostly to that. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, Shane Ferreter, Letterer Professor of Engineering in the Department of Mechanical and Materials Engineering. His work is an excellent example of how innovation that begins at UNL can make an impact upon the world. He's perhaps best known for developing a surgical robot to help doctors perform laparoscopic surgery, a procedure that is less invasive than traditional methods and often results in a speedier recovery for patients. This work is the result of a collaboration with the Medical Center's Dmitry Olnikov and a testament to the importance of working across disciplinary and institutional lines. He also has applied his robotics expertise to creating innovative solutions for agriculture, transportation, and other industries. Creation and experimentation are the common threads in his research. His approach to problem solving can serve as a model for the generation to come, ultimately leading to a stronger, more creative workforce. That's the goal and the purpose behind Nebraska Innovation Studio, also known as the Makerspace. This was a dream of Dr. Ferreter's, and in the short time since its opening, the UNL Makers Club has more than 700 members. We are excited to see the impact this group will have on Nebraska Innovation Campus, on the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and our state. I'm proud to note that Dr. Ferreter is a Nebraska alumnus, having earned his bachelor's degree for UNL in 1992. He also received a master's degree and a doctorate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, 
before returning to his home state to become a UNL faculty member in 1998. Now, he has often challenged uh, my credentials as a Nebraskan, uh, a, a born and raised Nebraskan, because he suggests, and probably will in his talk, I don't know, that all Nebraskans grew up as makers. You know, something broke, you fixed it. This is not my personal experience. <laughs> But uh, he will discuss what it means to have a maker's mentality and how to develop that skill to make us better innovators. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shane Fair. Thank you, Harvey. Well done. Well, thank you all for coming. It, uh, it's a great crowd. I appreciate everyone taking some time out today. It's a great honor to be selected uh, to give this lecture by the Research Council. And, um, uh, in some ways, I think it's quite unfair because the focus is much too much on me. Uh, I have been incredibly blessed and supported in my whole career here at UNL. So uh, Chancellor Perlman and uh, Vice Chancellor Paul have been incredibly supportive of my research and the work in the makerspace. And, um, the, but the more important supports probably come what most people would see is from the bottom up. This is a picture from my office I took this morning. This is the list of theses that I've had over the years since my time here at UNL. And I think there are eight National Science Foundation fellows in that group. Uh, there's people in there with, uh, the, with hardware on, now on Mars as part of the last three Mars rovers. It's really been an incredible bunch. And, uh, but given that, forget the sentiment, uh, being a faculty member is a pyramid scheme. So I sit at the top and I take credit for all that they do. After this slide, you can assume everything else is all me, okay? <laughs> so we'll dig in right here. Um, also, I guess at the, at the, probably the most important piece of my support is my family, who chose to come today. Uh, this is a family-themed presentation, so you'll see appearances from all the kids here. As I wanted to have a lot of photos in my presentation, and it turns out we own all the copyrights to these images, so that makes it very nice. Uh, the family photographer, my wife, is not in many of them because she's always taking the pictures, but Anna is going to lead us on an adventure today, so you'll see these guys appear throughout. As Chancellor Perlman mentioned, I was born in a small town in Nebraska. My dad owned a hardware store. My mother and father ran that all their, uh, their lives, uh, at least my life, and uh, I make things. I make things when I'm at work, and then I go home at night and I make things. This is from a couple years ago, an image of my workbench in the basement. And we're talking today about making for innovation. So there's different types of making. I think making can make you more innovative, as uh, there are several ways to become more innovative, and it's really, really important. Now, there aren't many mechanical engineering jokes, and there are even fewer hardware store jokes. So I just had to throw this one in there, the one joke of the talk. So too easy. The other issue is that I've tried to become an entrepreneur. So I started a couple companies based on our research. One, Chancellor Perlman mentioned, has to do with surgical robots, and we'll talk more about that today. The other one has to do with measuring the quality of railroad track. When I started to get into entrepreneurship, I realized I didn't know much about entrepreneurship, and I started to read a lot on this subject. And it's a hobby of mine to read about innovation and the process of innovation. So uh, today I want to take us through uh, a few sort of, of my core elements uh, in the process of innovation. I firmly believe that innovation is something that can be taught, something that can be learned, something that can be improved. So um, I'm still working on Chancellor Perlman. He can become a maker if he uh, puts the right mentality into it. So just a really basic definition to start out with. Um, I like this image. It's kind of a grainy image, but it's shocking to me. So when I buy laundry detergent, I buy the one that's there, right? This height, that's the only criteria for me. <laughs> Whoever has paid for that height on the, the so it goes down into the cart. That's uh, really all I look for. I think Tracy smells each one and makes some kind of determination based on smell. But if you look at all of these, they're all exactly the same to me. I really don't care at all. They're, they're one-syllable words. Um, they all have this, I don't know, 30-degree up angle to the text. It's just shocking how they're, they must be actively trying to be the same here. That's the opposite of innovation. This is me too technology. Uh, I think that my two criteria, it has to, has to be different. If you're doing the same thing like these detergents are doing, if, if you're doing the same thing as everyone else, that's a key that you're not being innovative. That's the first clue. The second thing I look for is good. It has to be good. 
You can do things differently and, and be bad about it. That, in my book, is not innovative. And I slide the words innovation and creativity uh, in and out of here. But these are the two things that I'm talking about. I think we should do things differently, and I think we should do things well. Those are my two chunks of criteria. One way to do that is through the process of making. And when I talk about making, it's not just the physical products. So most of my work is, is about physical things. But it can be software, it can be companies, it can be a lot of things. This is a famous um, maker. Henry Ford made the Model T. And I always point out that it's important to note that it's the Model T. T is, I think, the 22nd letter of the alphabet. I should count that sometime. But he made a Model A, Model B, Model C. The top left is actually the Model N, which was somewhat successful, and he sold a lot of those. But this is the way he thought through how automotives, uh, the automobile industry should function, how he thought through how people should use automobiles. When he started doing this in 1898, people really didn't know what cars should look like, how cars should function, how cars should be used. And it, he would build a model, then he would see how it goes. And then he'd build a model and see how it goes. I think there are a lot of people, again, Nebraska is probably overrepresented in this group, who think through problems physically. And that's gonna be the core of the talk today. Another bunch that did this is, is the Wright brothers. Uh, we had a chance to visit uh, Kitty Hawk, where they made their first flight in 1903. Uh, they were definitely making um, innovation through, excuse me, making for innovation. They started building gliders in 1899, and they built a season. They would go out each season, 1900, 1901, 1902. Then they finally flew in 1903, all trips to Kitty Hawk. All different machines, they called them, all different gliders. But they exist in a really important quadrant. If there's another book called Pascal's Quadrant, but you can make a, a chart which has usefulness on one side. You make four boxes. Something is useful or not useful. And then you can talk about academic rigor in the other axis. So something has academic rigor and something doesn't. So Thomas Edison, for example, was not academically rigorous. He just tried a lot of stuff. But he, he tried enough stuff that he made very useful things. Um, you can also talk about very academic folks whose research may not be terribly useful, but they're definitely very rigorous. But the interesting quadrant is called Pascal's Quadrant in this textbook, but I think the Wright brothers exist there. They made useful things, and they used great academic rigor. When they didn't understand how propellers should work, they came back and built a wind tunnel so they could study the problem formally. They used mathematical analysis, and were really good models of good engineers who thought through problems physically, who thought through problems by making. So again, as engineers, we like to have lists. I'm gonna to try to give you a few steps. Here are the steps you can take to be more innovative. Um, I don't know what comes after one, but let's, let's dive in here. This is Sarah's list. So the first thing I want to uh, point out is that we all need to adopt what's called a growth mindset. Uh, this is research from Stanford University, a, a psychologist named Carol Dweck, and I think it fits our, our football uh, uh, slogan that we often use, that it's the process that you need to focus on. The process is what's important. And she studies uh, lots of different folks, athletes, high performers at many levels, but two of the people that she points out that kind of explain the concept best to me are John McEnroe, who had a fixed mindset, and uh, Michael Jordan, who was probably the best basketball player of all time, who clearly had a growth mindset. So. Uh, People with a fixed mindset believe, hey, I was born smart. I'm smart. And therefore, they spend the rest of their lives validating the fact that they're smart. And when things went poorly for John McEnroe, it wasn't his fault. After all, he was the smart one in the room. And he blamed other people for this. And he had a much shorter career in professional tennis. He was incredibly talented, obviously, and he worked very hard, but had a fixed mindset. Now, Michael Jordan came out of North Carolina um, incredibly athletic, but not the best basketball player. So he came into the NBA, and uh, like everyone who jumps up a level like that, uh, people were faster and stronger in the NBA, and he didn't shoot the ball very well. I think he entered the league shooting something like 17% from the three-point line and exited the league at 47% or something like that. Uh, he improved throughout his career and retired a couple times, uh, playing his best basketball someone who improved it uh, from beginning to end. Now, as we look at this, we would all say, obviously, I have a growth mindset. I don't think, think things like this. But 
you know, very quickly you can, you can find people who say, listen, I'm not creative. That's not me. I don't do that sort of thing. Um, there are many, many examples. When you talk to your children, you can tell your children, hey, I'm, uh, I'm glad you did well on that test. You're very smart, right? Instead of saying things like, I'm, I was so proud of how hard you worked. And that can really make a big difference as you, uh, as you think through, uh, again, think through this. You have to think about the process as the most important thing. So this is a, this is a core tenet that if we do some things, we can become more innovative. If that's not true, then forget the rest of the presentation because that doesn't matter very much. I think we can all become more and more innovative. Now, one of my favorite tools for innovation is uh, something called Little Bets. And it's, it's subtly different than the way a lot of people think about innovation. I want to try to point out some of those points. It has uh, similarities to other um, other descriptions. So experimental innovators are an important thing. Uh, lean startup is a process about how you make startup companies through small little steps. And then agile programming is probably one of those. Rather than uh, waterfall or cascade programming, you need to take an agile approach to programming. So it's related to that. My best way to explain little bets is with Matthew and Anna playing with Legos. When they start playing Legos, they don't know what they're going to do. They're going to have fun playing Legos. That's their goal. The process is the focus. They take the Legos and they dump them out onto the table. Then they spread them out. They still don't know what they're going to try to build. But then they look for what are called small wins. They start picking through the pile and they find an interesting piece. So maybe this is an airplane wing and you say, hey, let's make an airport. And as you're building an airport, your airplane doesn't look like an airplane, so it changes into a space, space, space dock or something. And they adapt their goals from the process of uh, taking these little bets, finding these small wins. So kids are very, very good at this. And this is something that we squeeze out of people. Uh, I, I can't imagine ever finding a manager who's going to take a process or take a step like this. I don't know what's going to happen, but let's do some stuff to see how it turns out. And we should learn something in the process. Experimental innovators think that way. Middle managers do not think that way. So you have to be on guard for this. A little bet is an action. You have to do something. You have to allocate some resources. You're going to lose something in the process of little bets. That's key. But as you take little bets, your goal is to learn. Again, focus on the process. You're not, you don't really even care what the, what the outcome might be. Uh, and again, this is a famous example in the literature uh, when Hewlett Packard wanted to introduce the first handheld calculators. And they, do what big companies do. They commission a study, a marketing study. How big is the market? How many can we make? How much, what are the cost of goods? What are the retail sales? How many can we expect? What's the growth curve look like for the next five or seven or eight years? And it all came back, you know, that's okay. Some engineers will buy this. Uh, we don't see it as a mass market thing. Uh, it's probably not worth investing in. So David Packard, who is another terrific experimental entrepreneur, uh, didn't like that answer, just didn't believe it. Not that he didn't believe it, but he didn't understand it completely. These looked like cool things to him. So he said, let's make a hundred. And they made a hundred of these. And he started giving them out to friends. And he finally gave one to some guy in the airport, said, and the guy in the, in the, sitting next to him in the airplane, he said, I'll take a thousand, I want more. <laughs> and they, they made a thousand, they gave them to that guy, they sold them to that guy. And then they realized that they were getting more and more calls. We want more and more of these. And, there's an important lesson there. First of all, the smartest people in the world going into this didn't know what the right answer was. You can study and study and study, and people who have been in meetings with me, I get to a point where I want to stop thinking about the problem and I want to do something to figure out what the real answer is, because I don't think we're smart enough. There's a little bit of humility here. We're not smart enough to figure out what the real problems are. When I was in graduate school, my PhD advisor, told me a lot of things, he called me a lot of things, but uh, he said there's two ways to draw a circle. One is to take your time. I thought about digging up this, have you guys seen on YouTube this guy that draws circles so perfectly? They have these competitions about who can draw the roundest circle on a chalkboard. It's pretty shocking. That's one way to do it. But the other way to do it is the image on the right. Make the worst guess you can at a circle and then start, then look at it. What worked here, what didn't work here? If you look at that sort of oblong uh, ellipse there, you're clearly too sharp in the top right and the bottom left. We need to flatten those out. And you learn from the first effort and you can make a rounder circle in this way. That's quite important too. 
So the goal here is to learn fast. Now a lot of people will use these fail quickly to learn fast. The first one to fail wins, that kind of stuff. And I think that's probably the wrong way to phrase it. Uh, everybody's heard that, right? You gotta fail quick kind of stuff in entrepreneurship. That shouldn't be the focus either. The, the, the key here, so that's why I put it in parentheses, the key here is to learn fast, to build and to create as a way to think through problems. The bottom line I think is really important to me, that you wanna do something so that you can think about the problem better. Again, almost no one I know thinks that way. They, they say, let's sit down, let's figure out what the right thing is to do, and then let's try that. But the, the experimental entrepreneur will say, stop thinking about it, try something. And I think that's a key step to little bets because these things create small wins. And the small wins are like finding the airplane wing. You didn't even know that it was in there, but I'm gonna make an airport now because I found an airplane wing in the pile of Legos. You didn't know it existed, but that's, you weren't smart enough to figure that out in the beginning. You found out through the process of doing. So small wins will build on each other and you'll eventually get to an excellent position. This one I like too. This is uh, Luke. Uh, he had an idea, at least I think I remember this correctly, that he wanted to use his head to control video games. He was into programming video games at the time. So he built this little contraption. Uh, let's use a rubber band to hold it on. We can wire it up like this. Let's put on a hat because I don't have a better way to attach it to my head, right? These are not product ready ideas. This is not thinking through everything in the beginning. This is trying something quickly so that he can figure out, is this a good idea to control a video game by the motions of my head? So you can talk to him more about that after the talk. Um, that's another book I read. I have to throw this in here because I like this phrase. Uh, you guys know Norm Abram from uh, PBS? He, he builds these, he wears the plaid shirts and he builds stuff on PBS. He has this show called The New Yankee Workshop. Anybody help me out here? All right, we all know Norm, we love Norm. But he wrote a book with the famous phrase that you should measure twice and cut once, right? The assumption there is that you know how long the board should be, right? That you have an idea that this is the correct length of the board. If you know this is the correct length of the board, by all means, measure twice and then cut it, okay? Just make sure you've got the correct length. But I think the more interesting problems are where you don't know what the right length of the board is, and you should not measure, just cut a board, see how it works, and cut another board. Boards are generally cheap. Just keep cutting boards until you have the right board. Uh, maybe you don't want a board in the end. So don't measure cut twice, I think, is the better phrase in that one. Okay, I, should, I guess I shouldn't pause for questions. We'll have questions at the end. They're more formal than that. I want to change gears a little bit. I want to give you an example of our lab and how it functions in this making for innovation sense. So enough of this, let's talk about robots. This is Matthew's robot. We make lots and lots of robots. This is a collection of robots made by our students in our lab. Each robot is named after the lead designer. You can see there's a few signatures cropped in and out of here. So there should be a Tombot soon. Uh, there's a there's a Jack bot, there's a Tyler bot, there's an Amy bot, all kinds of different robots in there. If they're the lead designer, they get to name the robots after themselves. If you look at the images on the top left, there's an arm, and then you start to see these crawlers develop. When we started this, doing this work 10 or 12 years ago, my first thoughts were that we wanted to focus on imaging. We want to be able to image better inside of surgery. This is really a limitation in laparoscopic surgery. But it turns out we were kind of wrong about that. Really what we want to do is manipulate tissue and image. Just imaging is not enough. But we, we put both of those, that first robot went in an animal within two or three weeks. We started testing that within two or three weeks of the first one. This is a process of thinking through the problem. Now, you could also say like Thomas Edison would is we know all the ways not to build robots, which is important. But we finally come to a place where we think we know how to build a robot, what it should look like, how it should be shaped so that it can make a real impact. This is my colleague on the left, Dr. Dmitry Alinikov, and this is our cycle of little bets. We test these robots frequently, as frequently as we can. Uh, we've probably done, it's been a busy year, we've probably, this is the 10th month, I bet we've done a dozen surgeries uh, between the different groups at the medical center. So we test very, very quickly. I even have a mask on there. And this is the robot. I brought this guy here too. It's a little model of our current device. 
This is again, the, when you make robots, you gotta show hardware. So this is the little robot that we have. This is to scale, this is the right model. So you wanna straighten your robot out and you wanna make a small incision in the belly button. They inflate the patient to make some space in there. Then you can insert this robot inside the body and it kinda unfolds as it goes in there. There's a camera here that pops out, slaps down in there, and then the camera can look around left and right, up and down. You can pan and tilt the camera and control the camera. But once this robot's on the inside, it's it can reach anywhere in your abdomen. And that's really an important feature. So it's like we've shrunk the surgeon down. It's got two arms and a head, just like I have two arms and a head. Do we look alike? <laughs> and the surgeon now is unconstrained by this. It's as if they are inside the abdomen, which is where you want to be when you do surgery. So let's, uh, I think I have a movie here. Again, robot people show movies. Oh, here we go. One of the most important procedures that we're looking at is colon resection. People get colon cancer. Your colon is a tube that goes up, across, and down, and out the bottom. I shouldn't talk about what it does or what goes through that tube, but uh, people get colon cancer, and you have to cut out a section of the tube, and you have to reconnect it together. Our robot is the only robot that can access the entire colon. One incision in the belly button will allow you to reach other letters up there. H through all the way to A. You can rotate the robot and reach all these things. This is a really important issue. So let's just show you some robots here. Then we gotta get onto the maker space. Uh, so here's the robot just mounted on the surgical table, moving around. There's the camera looking left and right and up and down. You can see there's lighting and imaging there. You guys already know how big it is. There's a cell phone for comparison. Uh, I like to move quarters around, quarters are fun. And then the surgeon uses these hand controllers to control the device. Um, lots of uh, different features here I could point out, but you can see the hands of the robot have these little graspers, so you can grab things, rotate it around, and take another grasp on things. Now this little game where you put these soft sleeves on and off pegs is a standard way to train surgeons for this type of surgery. So we're just showing how our robot can behave like a, um, like a lapros normal laparoscopic surgeon. So, Going back to colon cancer, there's 300,000 people per year in the U.S. who have colon cancer. About 250,000 of those folks get an 8 or 10 inch midline incision to get in there and fix their colon. We think this robot will allow them to do it through a 2 inch incision in their belly button. And if I would show you my six pack, you, you would notice that, you know, you guys know what your belly button used to be? It's the space between the cans, right? It's a natural path. You don't cut much muscle, muscle as you enter through the... the umbilicus, your belly button. And you can uh, perform surgery that way. So we want to take those people that get the open incision and allow them to have the little incision. We think we'll shave about seven or eight days of hospital stay off of each of those people. So as we tell our students, and I remind them every day, if you can save eight days of hospital stay for 200,000 people per year, that puts you into the useful quadrant. And it's a good reason to get up in the morning. So that's just a little example. You can see how we thought through that problem. We didn't start out saying it's colon resection, we gotta solve the problem of colon resection. We started out saying, let's make a robot, let's try it out, and let's learn from that in, through that process. And then we made another robot, and another robot, and now we've made over 40 robots. And in the end, we've come to a good place because we've taught ourselves what the real issues are. What are the right things to do? So we'll, uh, we can come back to any of this in the end, but uh, I want to speak a little bit about a project we have going on here. Well, actually, that comes up in a little bit. The culture for innovation. I have to get this little stab in at the university before I do that. It's important, if, you, if you're going to be an experimental entrepreneur, if you're going to make for innovation, if you're going to take little bets, the bad news is, the, is you're going to have to do it. No one's going to give you permission to do this. No one's going to you're gonna to have to force this to happen. Now, um, the good news is, of course, it's possible. You can learn how to be more innovative. We can all move further down the innovation curve. This is a graph I like to show off, because if I, if I uh, did accounting and email like I probably should, I think I could have a 40-hour-a-week job doing those tasks. I don't wanna do a full-time job doing accounting and email and HR and those kinds of things. I wanna do engineering. So I try to carve out time for uh, creativity every week. And I should mention, while well, we have administrators here, 
you know, you can, you can think of crazy proposals. Let's have quiet time at the University of Nebraska on Wednesday afternoons from 1 to 3. No meetings. Nobody can send emails. This is time you're supposed to be sitting around there being creative about your problem. We're a research university. Let's do this. That's a proposal that will go nowhere. But it's a good idea. And it's something that I try to do. Uh, my other proposal, uh, next time I talk to the governor, if I ever talk to the governor, I'll bring it up. I would like to have no weddings on Husker football Saturdays. I'm sick of looking like this in the wedding receptions. No one will find a guy that thinks what marriage is more important than me, but couldn't we schedule them at different times or something like that? Couldn't the state help us out with that? I sat in my office one day, starting at 10 a.m. You can see in the top right at 10 a.m. At 10.04, I started doing creative things. At 10.04, the phone rang. And then at 10.10, I got an email that I looked at. And then at 10, 12, I was so distracted by the email, I did something else. So if you look at the differences in times, I can sit in my office, and the first, diff first time for interruption was four minutes, six minutes, two minutes, five minutes. I recorded this for about three hours. I said, I'm going to do this experiment for three hours. And the mean time between interruptions, I'm an engineer, I make these graphs, was less than four minutes. You can't be creative that way. You, you need to force this to happen. And so that's another little, uh, little thing that I would encourage everyone to do, is think about setting aside time for, th for thinking and for doing real problems. It's really, really important. And it doesn't happen naturally. So with that, let's talk more about the culture of innovation through something we're trying to accomplish here on Nebraska Innovation Campus, which is called Nebraska Innovation Studio. I don't know if Leanna is here. There she is. My partner in crime, Leanna Owad, is the uh, director of Nebraska Innovation Studio. Um, it's a makerspace. And a makerspace is designed, it's a space designed to help with everything I've said so far. So everything I've said so far is focused into uh, this makerspace. It's a space for creativity. We all uh, are aware that there are gyms out there that you can join. The rec center here on campus, or Prairie Life Fitness, or the YMCA, where you pay a monthly fee to get access to stuff that you don't have at home. You may not have an exercise cycle, you may not have a gymnasium, you don't have a swimming pool, but you want to do that stuff to become more fit, so you pay a fee each month to join these places because you want to become more fit. The makerspace is that for creativity. You may not have a table saw or a 3D printer or a laser cutter or a CNC router or any of this stuff at home, but you want to be more creative. So you can join a makerspace and uh, have access to these things. Now, when you do that, important things happen, just like at the gym. One of the important things that happen is you get to be next to other people who are also interested in making things. You can start to join a culture of people who want to be creative. I think that's really, really important. You can take classes. You can learn how to use a laser cutter. You can learn how to use a CNC router. You can just simply become smarter in the, these skills that you want to develop. And um, you know, just as examples, this is uh, stuff Leanna and I taught a class called Making for Innovation last semester, and these are outcomes from this class. We had uh, one student who designed a new dress that had electronics embedded into it, and she could push buttons and the dress would change shape. <laughs> we had uh, someone make a quadcopter. We had a sculptor on the right. Um, the orange thing uh, detects the moisture in your garden, and it puts up the blue flag when you need to water again. I think that's kind of a useful thing. Uh, the bottom left one is a tough one. It's called uh, Potbot, which just terrified me. <laughs> but I was very relieved that the student made this robotic device to stir his, uh, apparently his time is so important he can't stir his own spaghetti sauce. And he made a machine to stir his spaghetti sauce so he could walk away from his spaghetti sauce. That student's now a PhD program at Yale, by the way. <laughs> Not because of this. <laughs> um, these are things people want to have for themselves. These are things they're interested in making. Um, I don't think there's probably a product in this thing, but there's stuff that might bounce around the product realm. None of this is probably super innovative. I don't think the pot bot is going to get a patent application. But they're all right there. They're all close. So eventually, we're going to play a, a numbers game. Uh, again, it was mentioned earlier that we started a maker club here on campus, which is now an apocryphal story. but. Uh, night one, we said, let's have a meeting. I was pushing to build a makerspace on Innovation Campus. I realized, will anybody come? If we build it, will they come? We need to show demand. 
I felt strongly that there was demand out there and uh, we just scheduled a meeting. So we ordered pizza because pizza helps bring students. We ordered pizza for 50 and we had this meeting which was 240-ish. <laughs> People showed up at the first meeting. Again, now there are over 700 members. That was step one, was creating a maker club. The maker club has now done a lot of nice things, a lot of outreach to, uh, to uh, young kids and those sorts of things. They made the ribbon cutting uh, machine for Innovation Campus. But importantly, the demand is still there for Nebraska Innovation Studio, which I all hope you will tour across the hallway here. Uh, we have just over, I think we just broke 200 uh, people who want to join Nebraska Innovation Studio. We knew this would be a big demand. We were afraid everybody would show up for day one and they all want to use the table saw on the first day and we can't train them all. So we, are, we have a sign up list and we're now, I think we've had about 100 that we've asked to join and there's another 100 still on the waiting list. So the, the demand is real. And again, I think that's because, uh, one of the reasons is because we're in Nebraska. A lot of people sort of, I think, look down their noses at makerspaces, that we are a research institution and a makerspace is a community college function. If you want to go learn to weld or, or that kind of stuff, go to Southeast Community College or, um, you know, that this isn't really research. I would disagree uh, violently on that subject. And I think there are real differences with makerspaces that make them incredibly important. The first is that they're unstructured. Everything we do over on campus, main campus, is structured. You're told when to go to class, you're told what to study, you're told uh, how good you are at it by getting these tests back. This is completely unstructured. You only go there when you want to go there. You only make what you want to make. That's important. Again, if you look at the research on innovation, that is critically important. You make things that you're passionate about and you will innovate around things that you're passionate about. That's key. Now, I put this picture in here because this is Matthew and Anna uh, putting together a Lego set. And if you notice, Anna has this instruction book. This is something that frustrates me about Legos these days. When I had Legos, actually I had lock blocks were the cheap knockoffs, <laughs> the American made knockoffs, I think. Uh, they were just a bunch of rectangles. And that's all we had. If you wanted to make something interesting, you had to imagine it out of a bunch of rectangles. Now you can get incredibly complicated kits, which are, um, you know, you get a Death Star and an X-Wing fighter. If I wanted to make an X-Wing fighter, I had to do a lot of imagining to make it into an X-Wing fighter. But now there's a 40-page manual telling you how to, this is completely structured now. They've taken the, they put uh, so much structure in Legos. I see why. They are cool when you get an X-Wing fighter, but um, you, we lose something. Fortunately, at our house, all them, they all get mixed in the end. So the instructions get lost and uh, they all get mixed. The second thing that's important about makerspace is that you play there. You're not working when you're there. It's play. And Einstein said that play is the highest form of research. I really think that's true. When it's unstructured and you're self-motivated and you're playing, that's really important. You're intrinsically motivated to be there. This is, again, something that's repeated throughout the literature on innovation, is that you need to be intrinsically motivated. If you go to your team and you say, I need a new design for this product, and the best design will get $10,000 bonus. That's a poor way to motivate a design team. Just like when you tell your kid, I don't care what you do, you're playing the piano and you're doing it until you're 17, right? You hope at some point that transfers over to a love of playing the piano. It's a fine line we all have to walk, same with mathematics and whatever else you're trying to teach your children. But eventually, I just read a statistic, or my wife just told me a statistic that Something like 70% of adults uh, want to play the piano, and, and, but 70% of them once took piano lessons and gave it up at some time. There's, there's huge, interesting numbers around that. So guess what, kids? You're stuck. So intrinsic motivation is key. The other thing to recognize is that intelligence is diverse. This is something that engineers are guilty of. Me, I'm very guilty of. The only thing that makes you smart is your score in, on your ACT, your math, math, your math score on ACT. If you have a high math ACT score, you're smart. If you do not have a high math ACT score, you're not smart. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. But intelligence is truly diverse. Again, Henry Ford could not have scored more than five or six points on an ACT exam. He was not smart. He could barely read. If you ask him to read something, he would make up an excuse that he left his glasses at home. Uh, you know, he, I gotta leave, I gotta go to the restroom, something like that. 
Uh, he was embarrassed by the fact that he was not an educated person, but he was a mechanical genius. And you can be a, a, a dancing genius or a uh, making genius and not do well on your ACT math score. Okay, given all that, the makerspace we are creating is not a tide, a cheer, a gain, or a fab. It's a makerspace unlike any other. It's going to be a world-class space that has features designed to make it more innovative. There are lots of makerspaces you'll see in the world. There's a couple in Omaha. There's all kinds of different forms. Uh, some schools will create a makerspace by having an engineering lab. They'll rename it a makerspace, but only engineers can go there. We're not a makerspace like that. There are special attributes to what we're trying to accomplish. We call it actually Nebraska Innovation Studio with the I word in the middle because that's really what we're trying to focus on. And this is the image that always comes to mind when I think of this. Of course, this is Van Gogh's crazy painting. He was in a, a sane asylum when he painted this. But we all love it, right? Um, if you want to have an innovative space, again, based on the literature of innovation, first of all, you need a diversity, and a special kind of diversity, not some sort of politically correct version of diversity, but you need a diversity of ideas and a diversity of perspectives and a diversity of goals. Uh, that's the first step. Then you need a density of ideas. So you need to get the, these ideas together in the same physical place. This is the theory about why we have cities. Uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel talks about why civilization formed and why cities are getting bigger. Uh, it's because you need this density. It's very important. And that's a tough one for Nebraska. So the first is density. Uh, diversity and density are the first two. Now, if you look at campus across here, honestly, there is a diversity of ideas on campus. And there is a density of ideas on campus. What is it, 10 blocks by 10 blocks? It's pretty dense compared to the state of Nebraska. It's a pretty dense, diverse population. But one of the problems is I don't think we mix enough. You need a mixing of these diverse, dense ideas. And that's where the painting helps me remember all this. Uh, I can go a long time without uh, speaking to anyone in art history or anyone in, in the English department. We need to have that um, where mixing occurs. And I think that's where the university model that was created in Oxford in 16, whatever, 100, uh, of departments of, of uh, the structure is being challenged by interdisciplinary spaces like our nanoscience facility or, or the makers or the Nebraska Innovation Studio, which are, uh, are uh, different models of diverse, dense mixing. Now, the next thing you need is mechanisms for ideas to grow and mechanisms for ideas, excuse me, mechanisms for ideas to come together and mechanisms for ideas to grow. We're going to try to create that in Nebraska Innovation Studio. This is an example I give because we own a bison basketball hoop in our driveway, as you see there. Bison is a brand named uh, that's built here in town by a wonderful company. They make lots of different products, but one of the things they make is basketball hoops for driveways. Um, I've asked them, let's sponsor design competitions at the Makers at Nebraska Innovation Studio based around basketball hoops for driveways. What, how can we improve this product? How can we help them sell more of this product? First thing I think of is you should have score, a scoreboard, right? <laughs> you should have a shot clock, right? Now, modern basketball hoops have the, you can have the view from, how about a camera that looks down so that when I do that reverse dunk, you get a great Sports Illustrated type view of me as I'm doing these things. I think these things help sell basketball hoops, but I think there's more to it than that. If you're not playing basketball, these things aren't very pretty, right? Can we approve the aesthetic or the function around how they look when they're not being used? It's always there when you wash your car. Can your basketball hoop help you wash your car? Can, your, um, um, can it support other sports? If you put a net on there, can you throw a baseball back and forth and have it bounce back at you? Can, can you sell an assess accessory that will help you play uh, pitch baseball on your basketball hoop? I think these are great questions, and this is just a few off the top of your head kind of things, but the, the idea to get mechanisms, to get diverse ideas to combine and grow is to say, let's have a design competition, let's get 20 design teams together, and let's, you know, give them each 500 bucks and have them build something, have them think through the process by making to create a new product that will improve driveway basketball hoops. And I'd like to see this across lots and lots of industries. I hope that Nebraska Innovation Studio creates new product lines for all kinds of, of uh, local industry. 
Now, that's how we're different. We are an innovation studio. We're not just a makerspace, we're an innovation studio because we have density, we have diversity, we have mixing, um, we have mechanisms for ideas to combine and mechanisms for ideas to grow. Those are our points. And we have a lot of different ways that we're gonna implement that. Now the other thing that I think is special is, again, as Chancellor Perlman alluded to, is that the state of Nebraska is full of makers. All professional hockey players come from Canada. It's almost true. None of them come from Lincoln. And that's because in Canada, it's not because we're genetically different than Canadians. It's because there's an infrastructure in Canada to create professional hockey players. When you're four years old, here's a hockey stick. When you're five years old, you get pushed out on the ice. When you're six years old, you're on a traveling team. We don't do that, so we don't produce hockey players here. What we do here, which I think is special, is we create makers. When you're four years old, you're handed vice grips. When you're five years old, you're asked to climb down into the bend to release the auger. Uh, there's a long list of things that you do. I also think that we're probably the world's best per capita at backing up two axis trailers. <laughs> I'm not sure how to capitalize on that one, but I think we can capitalize on the making portion, especially when you're 14. <laughs> the 14 year olds that can back up two axis trailers is pretty special. This is something that we need to add to the, we have the bottom structure in place, we need to add this, we need to help people, we could lead the world in hardware-based products. Silicon Valley can do mobile app stuff, Silicon Valley can do online banking, let them make um, Instagram and those sorts of things, let's make physical products because that's what we're good at and let's become world leaders in entrepreneurship around hardware-based companies. Hardware-based companies are harder than mobile app companies. That's why there's so many mobile app companies, because you lock three programmers in a basement and just slide beer under the door every, <laughs> and what, Mentos and Mountain Dew, and they keep programming. Hardware's tough. You need a makerspace. You need something to make hardware. You need to know how to use a table saw. You need to know how to use a milling machine. We're good at that stuff. Let's, let's roll with it. The makerspace will connect people. We'll build on this Nebraska culture by connecting people. I have a few examples of this. The class already did that. I showed you the dress that changed shape because there were electronics in the dress. The, the textiles student couldn't have done that on her own. She got help from electrical engineering students who also happened to be in the class. We need to make more and more of these connections. I can't do surgery, but my partner can, and he can't make robots despite what he might tell you. <laughs> it's a different form of learning, stuff that you won't get in the classroom because again, it's unstructured. And I think it can be a source for entrepreneurship. I think everyone who drills a hole in the Nebraska Innovation Studio, I'm making the pot bot for myself. Is there a product here? Will people buy a, a stirring robot? Maybe it doesn't look like the one that Walter made, but maybe uh, it's like that. And we plan to have a strong link to a hardware-based business accelerator as part of that. I think you bring all this together and Nebraska Innovation Studio will be a magic place. And I know that's a supernatural word, but I think it will be a vortex of innovation. I can't wait until, these, these are all the milestones. People ask you about the milestones in here. My favorite one is the, uh, is it on here? Yeah, the first student wedding. I think people will think this is so cool that they will choose to have their wedding in the makerspace. Not, <laughs> not on a Husker football Saturday, I hope. We won't allow that, that we, can, we can control that one. Um, really, if you see the student said, hey, I made this, this is my product, this is my pot bot, my dress that I made, uh, it's really a different type of rewarding than, hey, look, I got an A on my test. That's gonna help me get my degree and I'm gonna get out of here. It's a, it's a different, a different uh, result from different motivation. Okay, again, I hope everyone will go across the street and tour, but this is, uh, even in the architecture, this is a plan view of what we're building. But first of all, you can see the kinds of things that we have here. There's an electronics, uh, where should we start? Top left, woodworking, and then metalworking. And then on the bottom is a digital fabrication area with all these new technologies like 3D printing and laser cutters. Then we'll have an art studio next to an electronics studio. That's a diverse group of people in there, if you have all those people. Now, in the architecture, you'll see a huge collaboration space that runs from the top to the bottom with open bench space. I want those people to talk to each other. We have a density of diverse ideas. We're gonna make them mix by the way we lay out our benches and the like. There's a multi-use lab and again, a business accelerator in the end. So we're trying to make it an innovation studio from the, well, from the bottom, from the very beginning. 
Now the university and Chancellor Perlman have been incredibly supportive, actually Chancellor, or Vice Chancellor Paul and uh, several other Vice Chancellors, I'm looking around here, have been incredibly supportive of this. We've actually completed a portion of the makerspace and it's open for business. I mentioned that there are 200 people who wanted to join. We have allowed about 100 to join so far. It's up and running, but only a portion. Uh, we had some funds to build out about a third of the space that's built in blue there. We're raising money to build out phase two, which we hope will open a year-ish or something like that so that we can be up to full capacity. But we're doing things we're learning by doing right now. So we're very excited about this. And I'll just end with a couple of projects. This was, uh, again, from our Making for Innovation class. This is an architecture student, a non-traditional architecture student named Alex, who made furniture. He was, um, there are a couple machines over there that are like crack cocaine, I keep comparing them to, that, that you, once you start using them, you start saying more, 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 and you make more, more, more. He was like that with our CNC router, and he made chair after chair after chair. This was his process of thinking through how he wanted to make his chair design, was by making more and more and sitting in them, and having a beer in one, and sitting there some more. I didn't show the pictures of him in his backyard sitting in these chairs. Also what he found out was that he liked the sheet of plywood that he would cut these out of. He would paint the back red, another piece of plywood, he'd put them together, and then he'd display those. That's a small win that no one expected. Um, but now we use these as our backdrop when we talk about Innovation Studio, and I hope to have one hanging in the hallways around here at some point. Uh, they're artistic in their own right, these, these leftover remnants from his process of making. I think I have one here. So I think the makerspace is going to be the coolest spot for, you know, I keep saying 500 miles, and maybe there's something cooler in Chicago, I guess, but... Um, Forget the bars downtown. This is going to be the cool place to be. This is Alex sitting at the table that he made on two of the chairs that he made as he thought through his chair designs. Now, this one. Um, this is from an artist friend in town. Charlie is here, actually. I like this example because this happened prior to the makerspace, but this is exactly what we want to happen. This was hard to get done. Charlie came to me and said, hey, I'm an artist in town. I want to make this. And my first thought was, uh, I can't help you, this is, I'm, I don't do art stuff, I make robots and those kinds of things. But Charlie connected with Tom here, who was a PhD student, and they decided to build this new, interesting piece of art. Now you'll see the actual thing is not quite exactly like Charlie's early design, but it makes me smile when I look at it. I don't know if that was his goal, and I'm sure he has some deep artistic um, thought or expression here. But to me, it's just a bunch of spinning uh, beach balls that make me smile. This is a collaboration between engineering and art that makes better art. And I don't know, it's a great example of that connecting of diverse ideas. Neither one could have done this on their own or wanted to do this on their own, but it's, again, the result is it makes me smile. So with that, uh, I'll conclude. Uh, I guess I should, as I come here, I realize I didn't talk about the violin. This is another thing that we made in the makerspace. This is a 3D printed violin, electric violin. So uh, my daughter keeps telling me I need rosin to play it, and I don't know how to play the violin. But it's a fully functioning, full-size violin that's been printed uh, in 3D. You can come check this out. It's electric. It's got a, a piezoelectric pickup here, and there's an amplifier on the back, so you can plug it into an amplifier and then play the violin. But why are violins so expensive? Can't we make violins easier? Uh, now that we have this 3D printed, we can injection mold these and just bang them out. I like to make three or four hundred of these and give them away. There are five parts that are assembled. There's a steel rod that runs through this, so it's kind of an interesting design. That's a collaboration between art and engineering that I want to have. That's music plus 3D printing. That's not a common thing that you see. We are creating an innovation studio that I hope all of you will, first of all, come across the hallway and tour, check it out, but investigate and increase your innovation through making. So thank you very much. So the um, talk is now open for questions. I think there are two microphones wandering around. And <clears throat> I can start off with a question, Shane. So you gave it very nice discussion in terms of the process, in terms of innovation. 
One of the things that I find is probably the biggest challenge to innovation is when you're working against entrenched dogma. So how do you, how do you fight that obstacle? Um, that's a good, first of all, he's covering for you guys. You guys got to ask questions, okay? <laughs> um, entrenched dogma is uh, a, a staple of the university, right? The university system. Um, well, you know, I think one of our biggest uh, challenges has been this, this uh, concept that this is about, um, you know, tech stuff that should, be ta should not be taught at the University of Nebraska. Uh, I think we'll win that through our first company that we start at the Makerspace and our first patent application that a student applies for out of the Makerspace. That will go away through the, the process of doing, just like I suggested here. Um, there's all kinds of other sort of entrenched dogma like I said, I could have a full-time job doing email only and uh, accounting. If I, can, if I did those things well, I could make that into a full-time job. I think if you want to be innovative, you have to uh, force that to happen. You have to take the time. You have to realize, I'm going to stop doing email here for an hour, and I'm going to let it slide, and I, now I'm going to spend an hour doing design work. Uh, so I think you have to force that. And I, I don't blame institutions. Uh, I think it's up to the individual to kind of observe what's happening, and then you have a choice to make. So I, I don't think it can be used as an excuse. So just some random thoughts that almost answer the question. Now, he gave you time. So uh, as you know, I'm a PhD student, um, Dr. Ferreter, and, uh, and I've worked with you a lot um, on your kind of the research side, and I've also had a chance to work with you on kind of the making for innovation, innovation studio. I'm curious, how can we build better connections between the research community at the university? Because I, I feel like there's so many professors who, you know, they're, they're brilliant in their research field. They, they come up with these great ideas. Um, how can making for innovation help them get to where they want to be faster? Um, you know, they rely so much on kind of fundamental analysis and we need to build up a model and we need to think for a long time before Let's we measure do anything. Twice. Yeah. Well, good question. Uh, Jay is the president of the uh, Maker Club, uh, so he's been incredibly supportive through all this. He's one of those minions in the pyramid that I step on every day. Um, well, I think it's a challenge for the university. I think that the university has been, been pushing this for a long, long time. but. Uh, I serve on a faculty committee uh, talking about how faculty will interact with Innovation Campus. And one of the challenges Chancellor Perlman always puts to us is how will Innovation Campus transform City Campus? How will it challenge the way we do traditional things? I think uh, Innovation Campus is a great uh, model for this. First of all, uh, you know, department lines mean much, much less out here. Uh, there's chances to get common lab space. I think there's a potential for uh, innovation Campus to be a big part of this chain agent. That's one of the reasons that Innovation Studio is here is because we want to interact with the diverse faculty members, the company members who are here on Innovation Campus. Uh, one of the things that committee is pursuing is an innovation curriculum to be taught on Innovation Campus. I look at this and I ask myself, where is innovation taught? Where is the process of innovation taught in undergraduate curriculum at the University of Nebraska? And people will pop up a hand here or a hand there and say, oh, I have a class over here that talks about design uh, thinking, or I have a class over here that talks about leadership or multidisciplinary teams. But I think we are now uh, hopefully making a formal decision to teach the process of innovation um, on Innovation Campus. I think that's, I think the makerspace, uh, Innovation Studio is one way we're going to transform City Campus. I think we can create an innovation curriculum that will transform how we function here. Uh, that's kind of the top down answer. The bottom up answer is, Students who are doing research in labs are going to come over here because they need a drill press. We have a drill press. You can join in, don't use a drill press. That's the bottom up answer. One of the things I love about the makerspace is it's 100% bottom up. It has nothing to do with chancellors or vice chancellors or vice vice chancellors, assistants to vice vice chancellors. It's all about students coming over and making things. So we should look and see how mad they are at. Uh, <clears throat> Shane? Hi. How can we get, you talked about creativity. Uh, getting innovation happening in, in the students here. But you also talked about how uh, creativity is, is innately there in, in your own children. So how do we get uh, the makerspace model, the innovation model, the creativity model, in kids who are five years old, kids who are at LPS right now, who I think get this stuff
kind of you know <laughs> shocked out of them at a very early stage. But I think if if we can get creativity, if th that kind of invigoration in young kids, once they get to UNL, they will be super ready for for this place. That's uh, a great question. Uh, another loaded question. There's a there's a book I love called Orbiting the Giant Hairball, which is a wonderful book. Uh, at least you should look at some TED Talks. Uh, uh, the IDO uh, guys, Tom Kelly, talks about orbiting the giant hairball. But a story that that guy tells, he was at Hallmark. He was an executive at Hallmark who wrote that book. And he started the black humor um, division of Hallmark. So, you know, Hallmark is about, to my lovely daughter, I love you so much, I will always love you, right? And that's Hallmark cards is what we think of. This guy said, uh, happy birthday, you're closer to being dead. You know, those kind of cards that he started. <laughs> so you can imagine the entrenched uh, dogma that he fought against there. One of the stories he tells is he goes to kindergartens and he says, who's an artist? And he talks about art and they all stick their, every one of them sticks their heads up. And it's just this exponential decay as you go up to first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and by the time you're in 10th grade, no one sticks their hand up and says, hey, I'm an artist, right? So there's something that is squeezed out of people over time. Um, I think that's changing. I think the Career Academy here in town is a great way to do it. Uh, Sabrina here helps teach a first robotics class inside Nebraska Innovation Studio. Leanna has probably done 15 different functions with uh, different young groups. We want to have family memberships to Innovation Studio. Uh, I don't have a global answer for you, but I think I recognize the problem and we're taking some steps to sort of uh, break that down a little bit. Again, when you're handed vice grips at four years old, we want you to keep using vice grips. Good Nebraska innovation. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm, I'm Wen Xiao from Department of Physics, UNL. So uh, I'm a postdoc here. I'm um, now working on the T-ball uh, uh, top uh, particle accelerators. So basically also innovation. So hopefully we can turn in the big conventional accelerator to a kind of museum. So that's our goal. Like and that. well, um, my question is actually, what is uh, uh, the goal for the innovation studio? You know, I was really impressed by the uh, impressed by the by the talk, by your lecture, and I saw a lot of kids uh, are working on some different innovations and some art and and science uh, working together. Uh, so it's kind of confused to me. So what is uh, the goal? here for the Innovation Center. And, uh, and another question is like the researchers like me, uh, um, how can we participate here in the Innovation Center? So I'm very interested in you know, you know, innovation things it's a, like It's things. another challenging question. What's the goal? So what's the goal for Nebraska Innovation Studio? So I start out by saying we're going to have a facility where anybody in the community, UNL students, community members, um, old and young families, they just go there and make stuff. They just make whatever they want. And they want a sauce-stirring robot, or they want a new coffee table, or whatever they want to make, they go there and make. And I could say, done. That's enough. Just people making stuff that they want is a nice extension outreach from the University of Nebraska. Um, so I could end there. That's, that's one spot. You, you could just simply stop and say, mission accomplished, goal accomplished. We just have 200 people coming in and out every day and they're making stuff that they care about. Done. That's not where we're going. So we have sinister uh, behind the scenes undercurrents. Uh, it becomes a numbers game. We've created the makerspace in such a way that the literature and innovation says it will produce inventions. So we have diversity, density, mixing, combining, all that stuff that we're just gonna go on there. So it's a numbers game. If you make 500 projects in there, most of them are picture frames and a, a quilt, uh, those kind of projects that are just literally just making. Uh, but it's a numbers game. Out of the first 500, there will be one product. I see it. I joined uh, Makerspace when I was in graduate school. And I can name off the companies that started there. One guy made this speaker system that you go to the museum and you push the button and you can hear about this exhibit and only you hear it because he, he went to this class with Ambrose Bose, the Bose guy. Uh, was a faculty member there and taught a class in acoustics and only you heard it and he sells those and I went to we went to Meteor Crater I should put that picture in here uh, and they had one there and uh, there's a museum in Okaboji that we went to an art gallery that had one there and I see these this guy made products there uh, I know I could go on and on I guess the, the other end of the spectrum is this square thing that you put on your cell phone and you swipe your credit card through there 
That was first built in a makerspace. So people make stuff. That's one goal. That's done goal. That's enough. On top of that, we've made this in a very special way so that we get products out of here and we serve the state of Nebraska. We educate our students better. We do economic development. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a long list of secondary goals that will come out of the makerspace. Does that make sense? Are there any other questions? Come on. Oh, How is it funded? Uh, yeah, so we've looked at a lot of business models for makerspaces, and um, one of the drivers for, our, for Innovation Studio here is to keep costs low, a low barrier of entry. We want our students to have access to this. Um, we don't want to charge them $150 a month. There are business models where you can create a makerspace and you can make money, but you have to charge $150 a month, you have to charge for every class. It gets burdensome for students. So the university has generously provided the space and some people. You take those two things off the table and then you fund it with memberships, basically. That's, that's the rough business model. Have I mentioned we're looking for private donations to build out the rest of the space? <laughs> so please join me again in thanking our speaker. Shane, thank you very much for inspiring uh, presentation and more importantly for your leadership in creating a culture of innovation. I think that that will have long-term benefit uh, for the community and for the state because I think the most important thing is that we need to, to think about and create the pipeline, provide the experience, the talent base, and with that along with the innovation campus and other uh, wonderful things that are happening in this state. I think that as a state, we will gain from it and, and we will be able to, you know, people will not only talk about Silicon Valley and Boston, but they will first talk about Nebraska. So with that, uh, uh, Shane, uh, there's a tradition that the poster that had been prepared for your Nebraska lecture, now you get to look at it every day. <laughs> so we, uh, we have a framed copy oh. for you. And one of the uh, copies will be proudly displayed in the research yes. office and video center. So then every time you go, you got to make sure you salute <laughs> that. So thank you very, thank you, very Tom. much. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our thanks to each of you for uh, taking time and uh, participating in this wonderful lecture. Uh, we take great pride in our um, you know, the uh, fantastic faculty as a, an example that you heard from Shane. Uh, there is a refreshment and a tour of uh, Innovation Studio downstairs. It can go back and down and over here. So I look forward to seeing you there. Again, thank you very much. Have a good, good evening. <laughs>